anybody find the golden egg this morning? Find a golden egg? egg? No, my wife's trying to kill me, though. So, oh. can, can you kill somebody with seasonal allergies? Because she's trying her damnedest. How does somebody... Okay. <laughs> I need... <laughs> I'm with Matt on that's what I further explain. That's what I said. Can can you kill somebody with seasonal allergies? No, no, no you're you're glossing over the the main point here. Could she can control the seasons? Oh, she can force me to go outside. Oh, oh yeah. Hey, okay, let's <clears throat> go to Garvin Gardens for the day. Oh, that's oh. a fantastic idea. <laughs> <laughs> what is of your nose and pollen? Yeah, Garvin Gardens is in Hot Springs. It's a uh, giant uh exactly what it sounds it it's a garden that's built out in the middle of the country with waterfalls and different plants and so forth oh so she's a uh like a flower enthusiast or something i mean she's female nah yeah <laughs> and and it's the tulip season out there so mm. yeah. yeah yeah shit I'm, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the uh, the non flower enthusiast females send their their hate on that one. I mean, I'm not saying all women are, but I mean, there's a there's a pretty good chance that you know. Yeah, the odds are the odds are in the favor. <clears throat> that yeah. You're not you're not wrong. I, I enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah, I I don't if don't dislike them they hate me right so yeah so i'm i'm drugged on decongestants and we'll see how this goes i, I want to get back if to I start sneezing here. and coughing yeah uh, but, well number one if you sneeze and cough that's that's fine i'm i'm you know do I, I can do you need zyrtec like i can drive some over to you no i took some decongestant and i have some allergy stuff but you know it it helps mildly right Craig, Craig dreams of a world where, with nothing but concrete. Um, no, I'm I'm totally fine with everything being outdoors. <laughs> just not. I just want to, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I want to get so back you, to something here because Matt sounded confused when I asked about a golden egg, and this this is going to further solidify my theory that Matt Trogdon was never a child; that he just emerged like fully formed and angry. Um, listening to metal music as an adult, um, Matt, did, did you did you never hunt the Easter eggs as a kid? Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Gold is a golden egg a thing? Is that like a super egg? Yeah, yeah. You get to go to Willy Wonka if you get it. Well, n- oh no. man, I, I hear that that place has got a very uh, concernable death rate for children. <laughs> it does. Lots of lots of traps. No, so maybe this isn't a thing. Um, and the we used to have these massive like town and county wide like egg hunts for kids when I was growing up. And, you know, they, you know, thousands of eggs would be hidden out there, but there was always a gold egg and a silver egg um, that if you found them, you won like some big prize that had been donated. Oh. No, Kayla, our parents loved us. They put out the eggs themselves instead of taking us to a city. It sounds huh? like your parents were embarrassed <laughs> to take you out in public is what it sounds like to me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, all our Easter eggs were hidden in the bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and they and they were mostly just like eggs that you painted yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. there, was mean, no really, candy, they, there was no candy. There was no candy-filled eggs. No, you, I mean, got, it, it, yeah, hard-boiled, yeah, colored eggs. Let's be honest; they weren't they weren't really eggs. They were rocks. I mean, but you know. It's magic. <laughs> Oh, uh, that sounds wait, y- y'all didn't have like chocolate eggs and stuff. Oh, I got an Easter basket when I was a child, right? Jelly beans and stuff in it. Usually a chocolate Easter bunny. Oh man. And then and then a bunch of eggs that the only way I was gonna eat them is if somebody turned them into deviled eggs. Gosh. Did y'all <laughs> y'all had that too where you get like the, the Easter afternoon lunch and like half the deviled eggs would have like the dye <laughs> marbled into them? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, that's just part of Easter, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Was this green before or what's what's the deal with this one? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, hey, everybody. Little Lee died, never hurt anyone. Oh, no. Shit. That stuff is like impermeated in our DNA now or somehow. Like, it's, it's never yeah. good. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another uh, Easter filled episode of the Southern Fried Geekery podcast. Uh, this is episode 171, uh, looking at the spreadsheet of the things. And I am Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. And I'm Craig Lance. And you have a spreadsheet to keep track of what episode we're on? No, but I keep show notes. Like I have a, um, I have a spreadsheet that is a template for show notes. With Damn it, Craig. <laughs> so on e- it just Of course you do, count. Caleb. Well, I don't have just like a list you of like numbers. I just keep a thing on there so I don't have to remake it every week. I, I have show notes and I erase them every week and start over the next week. Well, yeah. Have, I mean, you, I have you ever had a need to go back to previous show notes? Who me? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So I have to go back. I and... mean, that's not a multiple choice question. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I I have to go back and look at stuff. Um, so whenever I like actually upload the stuff to Lipson. Um, I have the show yeah. notes right there where I can type everything out. And then on Wednesdays, when I drop our, you know, I put our stuff on Instagram. Uh, oh, okay. So, I, I can either go back. So for a week, stuff. you need it. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and every once in a while, and this, this was more so before law school, I would keep like two or three weeks prior so I can go back and see what you knuckleheads had read and include the stuff that you read on our Instagram and Twitter pages, like put up pictures and stuff it's like, hey, this is something that Craig read or this is something that Matt read. Um, and just yeah, it. sorry, I I don't do those things. No, it's all good. No, but I mean that's what? That's, the <laughs> that's that's the reason I have them. Um, but like I said, I just I keep a show note template, and this is a little you know behind the scenes baseball that just it literally all, has all you children in your Instagrams and stuff <laughs> like that. It's fun, it's fun <laughs> to look at. But no, I keep a, a little sheet that has all of our names on it, and like a little section for short stacks, the round table, and the book of the week that I can just go fill in every week and it's got an episode section on it. So I just type in, you know, the number each week and it lets me know where we're at in life, which makes me, you know, makes it easier to say things like, Hey, Pastor. this is episode 171. <laughs> no one out there cares about this stuff. Zero people do. Oh, none. none yeah, they whatsoever. do. Um, uh, a lot like, of people on the show don't care about this stuff. <laughs> at, at least one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't bring it up. Y'all, y'all did this. This is your shit. You should be ashamed of what you've eaten. So says the person we don't talk about anymore. Uh, but anyway, you know what people are interested in? No, I'm not helping you with their bad no, segues. Anymore. Well, I was going to say, baseball. <laughs> I was, I was going to, I was waiting for one of you baseball. say, I was going <laughs> to wait for one of you to say comics. And I was going to say no baseball because the MLB kicked back up again. Um, and I know one, Mr. Craig Lance has been just like a happy as a kid in a candy store. Um, it, if I could get away with it, I wouldn't move from in front of my TV for the next week. Uh, dude, wow. I'm, I'm so jelly because I haven't actually got to sit down and like, you know, watch a single game, but I just keep checking the Cardinals page every five seconds to make sure nothing happens. They got in a fight last night. I know. It was great. <laughs> uh, dude, did you see where the A's, um, <laughs> the A's, when the Astros came out, they played the like she's only happy when she cheats or whatever song. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then they got their ass kicked by oh, nine to one. Demolished. They got destroyed. So yeah. Great. But this isn't a baseball show. No, you silly. Thank silly. God. Sit the go ride the bench, Matt. You're you're fine. Um this is a <laughs> comics show. And we are going to talk about comics because that's what we do. That's what we we love to do. We all it's how we all met each other, get together, laugh, cry, and talk about this sequential art of things. Um, and we hope you do too. If you want to know more about what we're reading, or maybe you want to tell us about what you are reading, you can always get your little fingers, put them on the keyboard, journey over to our Facebook page, uh, join the Southern Fried Geekery podcast group online, where there's lots of folks they are talking about what they're reading, what they're watching, lots of pop culture in general, checking on folks. Um, at least a lot of fun memes oh memes galore it's it's great uh funny as shit uh especially some of the godzilla memes that have been posted Uh, and not just the ones that i've posted (laughs) Uh, it's fun stuff but uh so i'm curious (laughs) as always what are you fellows reading what you've been reading this week 
Um, yeah, I read Redneck number 30 by Image Comics. Uh, Donnie Cates, Lissandro, Estheron, and Dean Kenneth. This book went to a place that is a trope that I kind of have become loathe of for oh. uh, uh, vampire genres. The rebellious vampire that's taking on the Elder Council. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm hoping that Donny Cates at least writes it well because that has become too much of a trope that I'm just kind of over in vampire books. Um, sea of Sorrows number four, IDW, Rich Duick and Alex Cormick. This continues to be a very, very good uh, underwater horse story with uh, mermaids that open up and eat people like their entire stomachs open up full of teeth and devour you. It's horrifying and also fascinating. And then X-Men number 19, Marvel Comics, uh, Jonathan Hickman and uh, Esrar. Uh, This uh, book was a story of love lost and gained and lost and, you know, time going on forever and how their resurrection process can actually affect one person and not another based on where their memory was stored. Hmm. Yeah, it's gotten a lot of chatter. I haven't, it's still in the middle of my stack. I haven't gotten there yet, but lots of folks have been talking about the the quote unquote impact of this book. It was uh, middle of my stack too, but I only had three books in my stack. So Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, I only had, I think I only had four, four this week. Yeah, I read, in my short stack, I, I read that book as well, X-Men number 19. Um, yeah, this one was really weird. Uh, pretty smart story. I, re- yeah. I, I, I really like the character X-23, especially when she right. is written. Um, well, I like Jonathan Hickman writes her. And uh, so I really dug this issue if for no other reason i got to read a lot of um x23 yeah uh also i read from image from jonathan hickman and mike huddleston decorum number seven uh i i totally understand what's going on in this story totally 100 <laughs> percent. i understand what's going on that, and i'm that's following why I quit it easily reading it. that's why I quit <laughs> and, <reading> it. <laughs> and uh so yeah I also recommend you read it and follow along easily as well. And, and then it's send Matt a, a DM telling him what's going on so he knows. <laughs> and then uh, also I read from Image Comics, Moonshine number 23 from Brian Azzarello and Eduardo Risso. Man, this has got a great cover I have to talk about. It's a Eduardo Risso, of course, cover of a werewolf standing on top of the Brooklyn Bridge. And there's mm. fog over. I mean, it's it's a great freaking cover. Nice. And yeah, and of course, this part of the series, the werewolves. There's two werewolves that are now in Brooklyn and um, doing their deeds by night. And this is a g- great example of uh, historical fiction because it includes all these true historical. Um, law enforcement officers of the time of the yep. 1920s and the gangsters and also a string of murders that were happening. And Azarello and Eduardo Riso are telling the story that these werewolves are what were causing it. Wow. Nice. Yeah, so it's uh, that's a book that when there was such a pause between volume one and volume two that somehow the local comic book store did not... Uh, transfer me over when volume two started and i have not been getting any of it since like the sixth issue and it makes me mm. really sad because i love that book yeah well surely, there's, bro. surely there's a hardcover in the making in the that, future yeah. i'm sure there, yeah. there needs and, to be y'all know that meme from like it's it's hawkeye from the avengers where he's just sitting there with his like hands quenching up his cheeks staring longingly and lovingly at something no, that's that's me. Well, of course you don't, Matt. That's that's me looking at anything <laughs> Eduardo Riso draws. Just it's stupid. I just have except a, this because you're not reading it. Art crush on that. I flipped through the pages. I, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I've seen the art on it, <laughs> but it's still. <laughs> uh, it's, 
his art never ceases to just astound. Um, speaking of astounding, uh, and somebody else who does some really, really cool art uh, is that person's name is Elta Chartier. Uh, I read November Volume 4 this week. And for those of you who have um, heard us talk about this on the show before, uh, this is a kind of a police-ish type mystery story um written by matt fraction drawn by elsa chartier matt hollingsworth doing the covers with kirk ankeny on the letters and it comes out instead of coming out in single issue form it comes out in volumes little hardcover um chapters if you will uh and this feels like the wrap-up to the series i don't know if they're going to go anywhere after this but um again elsa chartier feels like a a spiritual successor to darwin cook to me i I love that style um you know she's got a lot of a lot of eduardo riso in there too um there's it's there's a a solid thread uh you know long and short of this part of the book um all of the wrap-ups with the uh dirty cop and the mafia um are they kind of come to a head and they unravel and of course the main character this woman who used to be a cop but got who who got you know kicked to the side and who's now a 911 dispatcher she emerges the the hero a little bit but she pays a incredibly hard cost in in doing so like the, it is the book is not necessarily kind to her um but she does emerge which is cool uh second on my little short stack is a little manga i got some got some manga action going this week um there is a series called witch hat altier it's an all ages series um by Kamomi Shirahama. Uh, this book was uh, introduced to me by Mr. Tony Fleece, who's doing Stray Dogs right now uh, over at Image. He's writing it. Um, he was like, hey, you know, everybody should check this out. And he wasn't wrong. So it is a story. Uh, it, it, it's easy and um, probably too easy to boil it down and say, hey, if you're, you know, if you were a fan of of books like Harry Potter, you'll like this because it is very much involving like witchcraft and a young person who was not raised in that world um, being dipped into it, but it's not so uh, quote unquote westernized. Um, so there's this young girl who is, you know, she's a person who's not born into the witching world, but who gets adopted into it um, partially because this, this witch who may or may not be a bad person. We don't know um, just kind of drops off a spell book and a wand to her. And she's like, Hey, play with this child. And which is never a good idea. Uh, but she does. Um, nonetheless, what happens is she has kind of a natural affinity for it, um, and she gets brought into the world, albeit at a much older age than the other people who are her contemporaries, the other students, um, and she's trying to learn the magic of it all. Um, and of course, there are some behind the scenes uh, uh, things happening with this secret witch and the person who becomes her teacher. It's it's super good. It's, it's dope, reads quick. Um, the art is beautiful. The designs are incredibly cool. Um, so, and, and like I said, it's an all ages book. So if you're looking for a book for, for the youngins in your life, um, that, you know, check this out, get them, get it for them. I think they'll really enjoy it. And then last, but certainly not least, um, maybe the quote unquote heaviest book of the week is a, a book that just came out. It's a hardcover by a cartoonist that I adore, um, Mr. Nate Powell. And the book is called save it for later promises of parenthood. Uh, promises parenthood and the urgency of protest now you know you know nate powell he he drew the march trilogy uh and from you know that told the story in the life of congressman john lewis he's very much a social activist um kind of a a commentary uh you know a long-form commentarist of of whatever the word is i'm looking for of our time Um, but he the book is all about kind of this rise of the you know the alt-right and the iconography that they use over the past uh you know six years or so and the emotions that go into it as being a parent like trying to teach your child the difference between right and wrong trying to teach them to you know to love their neighbor knowing full well that their neighbor might not love them back or might actually be dangerous um and especially about how you know trying to teach your kid that you know as, as white children um you are afforded a certain amount of comfort and safety in society that other children uh don't um, you may not recognize the things that, that children of color or, or immigrant children recognize as being threatening. Um, and so you just kind of have this natural veil of safety and how to how to teach your kids how to navigate that. Um, it was a like I said, it was a heavy book, um, it, but it was well worth the read. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, Nate's Nate's cartooning is just top tier. It doesn't get much better than that. So. 
check it out. Nice. It's, it's a pretty little hardcover. So nice, yeah. nice. It was. Got up this morning, had my coffee, got some book on. It was great. So <laughs> speaking of which, I didn't ask you guys how how were your weeks? Like, what did you guys get up to this week other than reading comics and watching baseball? What else is there? <laughs> well, I mean, it's stairs at Matt. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah, my, my stack was, was uh, light this week, too. Um, I only had four books. Yeah. So, mm. yeah, I didn't. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just kind of a typical week, quite honestly. Did some work. Did some reading. Yeah. Did some uh, watching some baseballs. Got a little relaxing action in. Yeah, a little bit, you know. Nice. Yeah. Well, mine was just filled with the same old, same old school work and all that fun stuff. Um, and then chatting with you guys. Um, specifically, while we were chatting, this one kind of thing came up that kind of was kind of like rocking the, the, really not the comics world, but like the pop culture world. And that was WB um, pulling the rug out from under the new gods movie from what it sounds like um and just getting rid of it i know you guys had some you know pretty i want to say visceral reaction to that um just kind of unfortunate i mean matt probably more so than i on being disappointed that it's canceled i'm not a huge um whether it's marvel or dc i'm not huge on their uh space galactic stuff you know so but matt i know i had some feelings uh i had mixed feelings about it uh yeah. i wasn't thrilled about the about um who was connected to it but <laughs> i really dig the new gods stuff um and the potential for it being on the big screen i I was more positive about it than not, but you know, overall, it's just one more thing that the uh, DCU is doing that just continues to be questionable. I guess, right. and, and, you know, to, it's just another seemingly random left turn that they do to um, stop their own momentum. Yeah. I, I agree with that. It's you know you you, you I, hire two creators to work on something for a year and a half, two years, and mm -hmm. then decide, you know, nah. It's like, yeah. what next, DC? What next? Well, and it was there was another movie that was stopped as well. So um, yeah, trench, you know, I guess the trench, yeah, the Aquaman yeah, the sequel or whatever that James Wan's been working on for a while. Well, that wasn't an Aquaman sequel is the way they describe it as an Aquaman spin-off spin -off about okay. the creatures yeah. that leave in the, in the, you know, and that sounded like a weird idea from the get go. That I thought that sounded like a flop in the making. Well, James Wan doing horror makes a lot of sense. So I think that's what they were going for. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I didn't see how it really connected to, the DCEU or what they were trying to do with that. So, you know, just as you said, they just, uh, whether it's leadership at the top or whatever it is, they can't really make up their mind where they're going and what they're doing. And they shot themselves in the foot by giving into a toxic group of fandom. Yep. And uh, now this is the pay for that. Yeah. I <laughs> So I'm a I'm, I'm kind of like you guys. I'm I'm a little bit torn on it uh, because I, I was interested in what those creators were going to give us. Uh, like I, I like Ava DuVernay. I mean, I, I know you guys disagree with me. I, 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 you know, Tom King is a great writer, in my opinion. I read most of what he does. Um, but after after what we saw with the, you know, the quote unquote release, the Snyder Cut crap, and then now this new the same people are like repositioning and launching the quote unquote restore the Snyder cut thing. And they're being just as toxic and being, you know, Snyder verse. Yeah. Yeah. Just as abusive as, as ever. Um, oddly enough, one of their biggest champions is Rob Liefeld. So let that one sink in. Um, but they, I can see, especially after what those same people did, like trying to 
to carpet bomb the I think it was Kong versus Godzilla movie, which had nothing to do with it. They've been carpet bomb- bombing movies for a while now. Yeah, so just, it's, this is just, nothing new. Yeah, not wanting to, but you can imagine the vitriol and the the shitstorm that would come out of connecting to something that you know Snyder actually did work on, um, and then is out of his control. And so, on some level, I think they made a little bit of the the right decision in that regard to avoid all that nonsense. It just sucks because you know good people are, have to suffer because you know to to borrow a quote that we've all, all seen and, and shared, but to because they negotiated with terrorists. Um, essentially, like they they gave people that leg to stand on, and now they you know this more and more uh, this this evolution of quote unquote fandoms um, ownership or perceived ownership that this stuff is theirs and they have the right to dictate what creators do and and even what creators work on the stuff is it's it's just a a sad situation all around. Um, so, but I, yeah, so I'm, I'm like, I, I, at the end of the day, I think based on what they'd done before, removing that process or removing the, the potential for that nonsense to, you know, cultivate and permeate and build on itself was the right idea. And I think it's going to save some of those people a lot of grief, but it's really shitty because those people were not the ones who should be punished for it. So uh there, there's got to be a change in yeah. leadership at the top of, of of warner brothers um all around just for its own sake so. <laughs> at least whoever's in charge of the dceu right so need some but need outside some. of that we did something else fun what did we do we read a book we did read a book uh and it was that good good I, at least in my opinion it was that good good Um, so we got together as we always do. And we decided to check out, um, a book together, so to speak. We're like, we're all going to read the same thing and and chat about it and, and see what we think. Uh, and that book, I think I called it this week because it was by a creator that I kind of just, man, I, I, his stuff is fun. It, uh, it makes me happy when I see it on the page. Uh, and that is Mr. Daniel Warren Johnson and DWJ, uh, used to seeing some of his stuff over at, at the, at, you know, the distinguished competition, he jumped across. He went over to the house of ideas and wrote a little book. Um, going to be a five issue series called beta Ray bill, um, with colors by Mr. Mike Spicer. Now this made me happy. Like my, my cheeks hurt from smiling. Um, how did, how did it treat you guys? Yeah, I really enjoyed the, this book a whole lot by the third page. I was completely sold. Yeah. Great book. Mm -hmm. Yeah everything about it, the story, the, the art, all of it. Yep. So the one thing that kind of surprised me, I I won't say shocked, but surprised me, I I guess I'm used to seeing uh, DWJ like work in these earth two or standalone things that don't really tie into the, you know, to the overall shared universe, Uh, you know, kind of like he did with wonder woman. He's done a few of these things. But um, but Beta Ray Bill doesn't do that. Beta Ray Bill actually ties into the overall, like this current thread of Marvel a little bit. Not so much that it's heavy handed, but it it does have roots in the King and Black storyline that's been happening. Um, this been you know spearheaded by by Donny Cates and has to do with Venom and all that fun stuff. Um, so what you have in this book, uh, Asgard is is under siege. It's under attack. Um, by a <laughs> by a character that we all know, at least I love, and I get giddy when he shows up because he's just kind of ridiculous. But Fin Fang Foom has been taken over by these symbiotes, by the uh, uh, by this these this null legion, and is just kind of wrecking shop in Asgard. Uh, and Thor is, you know, he's MIA; he's nowhere to be found. Um, but Asgard is not without its own champions. I mean, you've got, you know, Lady Sif and the Warriors Three, and they're trying to handle things, but they're not the only ones there. Lo and behold, uh, our buddy Beta Ray Bill is just kind of kicking it. He's he's uh, you know, he's he's hammerless at the moment. His face has been restored from Donnie Cates, like ripping it off. Um, but he's just chilling in Asgard. Um, got a little little romantic thing uh happening, or you know, at least growing with Lady Sif, kind of 
trying to see what's happening with that um, or, you know, what's not happening with that. And as Fin Fang Foom uh, rolls in there and all these like null legions come in there, they, they turn uh, to Beta Ray Bill for protection. Uh, and, and he does his best, uh, but sometimes our best is, is not enough. Uh, e- even with the help of Scuttlebutt, his little spaceship that he has uh, like a link to, just, you know, they, they seem like they're going to be overwhelmed. Uh, and there for a little bit, they are. There's just kind of carnage happening. Um, and, and watching Fing Fang Foom um, just snatch up Beta Ray Bill and pummel him a little bit, uh, at least as it's drawn by Daniel Warren Johnson, uh, is just kind of really fun, uh, even if you want the good guy to win. Um, but just when things seem like they're they're going south, when they're not going to get, uh, when, when, when Null and his legion have the upper hand, um, you know, the sky lights up, the thunder roars, the, the heavens are torn asunder and, uh, the God King himself, Thor, uh, hammer and all float down to, to save the day. Um, once again, ripping, <laughs> ripping the accreditation and the, the, uh, victor- victory and the adulation away from Beta Ray Bill. You know, we've kind of seen this before. Um, and, and Bill's a little jelly, you know, he, things aren't going great for Bill like, again, you know, um, he, he wanted some of the spotlight, uh, you know, Sif is, they've been kind of flirting back and forth. There's a little something, something happening there. Uh, and when, when there's, you know, there's this moment where they're about to, uh, consummate what's been happening there. Um, Sif's like, can you, can you fix your, your face? And he's just like, no, no, I actually, I, I can't, this is stuck like this. This is just, and she's just like, oh yeah, this is not going to happen mainly because I have eyeballs, which is sad. So, you know, depression sets in. Uh, and by the end of it, you, you get this moment where there's a little bit of a standoff between, between Thor and Bill and he, Bill's just kind of had enough. He's tired of playing second fiddle. He's, he's tired of being in the, the shadow of, of Thor and, you know, being this guy who swoops in to, to carry the heavy load, but get, getting ignored, uh, getting tossed to the side. Um, so he jumps on scuttlebutt and, it, you know, takes off into space and where he's going. Uh, we don't exactly know where he's going to end up. Um, but, but he's all up in his feels. So, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he finds himself hammerless. He doesn't feel like a hero. You know, he's, he's obviously without a people, um, cause that's kind of his general story. Um, a lost in the universe. So he's going to go figure some stuff out, go on this little space adventure. And that's where the book closes as scuttlebutt blasts off. Um, did I do the book justice, fellas? Yeah, I mean, I don't remember anything with uh, with Noel and his people in the book, but outside of that, yeah. Um, uh, you know, I just want to tell Beta Ray Bill he's beautiful inside <laughs> and out. <laughs> you, and he doesn't have to run anywhere. Yeah. Mm. You, you, you don't have to go anywhere. You're, you're all good. Just, just be you, boo. So the reference, just to just to step in, the reference to to Noel and all those. If you look at Fin Fang Foom in this, he's got that that spiral on his forehead. That's the that's uh, the mark of Noel. So that's the where he's been taken okay. over by Symbiote. If you if you were reading the King and Black stuff, all of these heroes, all of these like global powerhouses are being taken over, uh, and that's how they denote that they are um, now in the clutches of Noel. Um, so to speak, because they get the whole doesn't really need to be under controlled to be a bad guy. No, he he does bad on his own. But, but you, you know, know. Fing yeah. Fang Foom under Here the we are. under the machinations of a cosmic space god <laughs> for evil. Even scarier. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Um you know, I D Darren Warren Johnson's art does not always hit with me it's always good but it doesn't always hit based on when he does intellectual property for other people Mm -hmm. does that make sense um but i loved it in this book you know i i love his art when it's his own properties a hundred percent of the time and I, i love it even in the books when it's not it's just sometimes it misses when it's uh what do you mean, like his interpretation of established yeah, characters? Yeah, his interpretation of, of established characters. Yes, that's all. Um, 
but because most of the time he plays it in, as you said, kind of alternate universes, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I wondered how that was going to play in with Beta Ray Bill. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely loved it. It worked 100% for me. I, I never get tired of seeing him draw spaceships, whether or not it's, it's star Wars. I mean, if you follow, uh, if you follow him on Instagram or you check out his commissions and stuff, the stuff that he does with, with spaceships is, is ridiculous because it's, you, you, you look at the world around him, uh, you know, and a lot of his backdrops are very, um, they're, they're very black and they're very inky, very murky. Um, some of the way that he draws these widescreen stuff, the people are, are, you know, they're not hyper detailed, but then the way that he lays out the texture of the spaceships is like, he's got a love for those things. And, and you also see the same thing when he draws like mechs, like every once in a while, he'll do these Gundam uh, warrior uh, things, which why they have not put him on a, on a Gundam book or why he's not doing that. I just fail, you know, that's just a failure. Uh, mistakes have been made. Um, but it's, it's so cool watching him draw these action scenes. Um, now, Craig, did you, you weren't hot on his wonder woman book. Were you, if I remember right. Oh, I, I read the um, first few issues and it wasn't that it was bad. I mean, there were great parts in it. I mm -hmm. absolutely loved when she ripped out Superman's spine and turned it into a whip. Um, you know, the story was great. I, I don't even remember honestly why I fell off of it. It wasn't anything to do with the story. I just lost interest at some point in it. That that cheetah arm though. Do so what? That, I said that che cheetah's arm. <laughs> they, they gave oh, they yeah. gave cheetah a literal cheetah arm. <laughs> Matt, you're being quiet over there, buddy. Uh yeah, I mean the book, it looked great. Um I like uh, Darren Warren Johnson's uh, pencil work, pencil and ink work. I mean, it looks it's dynamic. It's a hell of a lot of fun to look at. It was, it was. I don't know. Uh, it's funny seeing his work in the standard size comic book format because the last few things I've right. seen him do have been the oversized format. So I'm like, man, they really crammed his work into a small format here. It just it looks out of place in a normal format. <clears throat> but yeah, no, it was great. It was, it was, it was really fun to look at. Um, you know, the, the self-pitying of Beta Ray Bill at the end of the book really turned me off. I got to say, I'm like, Oh God, why is he feeling sorry for himself? This doesn't feel very Beta Ray Bill, but he just got know. turned down by Lady Sif. Yeah. And he's all mopey. I'm like, Ugh. He's got to regain his footing. It's the it's the the hero's journey. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta He's all mopey. I yeah. love you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> God, man, I didn't get Heard to kiss my the girl. Ray Bill mopey. Yeah. But how sure dare was... he have feelings? And <laughs> <laughs> sure wish I was pretty. Let's go spaceship. Well, okay. he's a horse without a, a hammer. So maybe like think of it that way. Somebody took his 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 hammer away. You you'd mope. Yeah. Him. Yeah. And Thor stole his thunder, literally. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Thor gets all the women and gets the lightning and the thunder, and Beta Ray Bill gets to leave on his spaceship, feeling yeah. sad and depressed. Yeah. Like, okay. I think my favorite Matt thing... <laughs> I think my favorite thing about this all through the book is that apparently they're watching Hook. <laughs> like, apparently... uh Beta Ray Bill loves the movie Hook because there's these little glimpses of television all throughout, and it's the scene where they're shouting Rufio, Rufio, Rufio. <laughs> uh, it cracked me up. That's I did not catch that. Oh, did you not? Yeah, I don't remember anything. No, I don't. I don't yeah. remember anything about the movie Hook. I remember it was a thing, and it came out, and that's about it. Oh, dude, I love. Yeah. That well, age. Yeah, no, you that know, movie. Our, our ages when it came out probably determined how interested we were in that movie. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it had a good cast, though. Like, I mean, even yeah, even beyond what it was, it, it was interesting because you'd never really seen that side of things, um, at least in in like mainstream pop culture. 
but yeah, no. So if you if if you go back through this book and you see those little glimpses of TV, um, it's it's Hook. <laughs> they're watching Hook. Lots of lots of Rufio champ changes. So on whatever planet they're on, they have uh, they ha- I guess they're in Asgard. They mm-hmm. have cable because the Rainbow Bridge was there. So I guess they were in Asgard. So yeah, they have well, cable. He's on. They he's on Scuttlebutt. <laughs> So apparently he's got satellite. So apparently he can pick you know, like scuttle scuttle oh, the there you go. waves. Um, but yeah, no, it's just those moments in Daniel Warren Johnson's like storytelling. Like you get that little bit, and and Daniel Warren Don- Johnson, like if you read his stuff, he doesn't do anything by mistake. So it's one of those situations. Like I want to email him or something and be like, hey, it, you know what what connection is there? Because it seems odd, right? Like why put that reference into this? Uh, it makes me want to go back and, and watch the movie hook and then try to like catch up on some so similar the references is that Peter, Peter Pan never grew up and beta Ray bill lost his childhood. That, that could be it. That very well could be. It. I didn't think about it that way. So, um, yeah. So are you guys going to so, stick around on this book or what you thinking? I, I will be sticking around on it. Yeah, I'll give it another issue or two at least, probably. See how mopey Beta Ray Bill becomes. Yeah, you know, see how long he lays in bed and cries. Three or three <laughs> issues, I guess. I, pining for Lady Sif. Yeah, wish I was pretty. Why can't I be what? pretty? I mean, what happened between Lady Sif and Thor? And I'm the Thor enthusiast here in the group. But when, I mean, they're just never a thing anymore, I guess, now? I don't think so. I, I think that they've... Uh, I don't know if it's because, you know, technically he's the God King now or, you know, the all father now, or it's, that they, a, it's been a while since they've been to, I mean, since the Jane Foster stuff. Right. So I don't, so, I don't know. Um, oh, I do. Yeah. Well, part of that may be just be the, the people in charge of the characters and writing a book want to give, Maybe maybe they want to give Sif some some room to grow outside of connectivity to being a love interest to Thor. I, I don't know that for a fact, but like that would that that's that because Jason be Aaron hates Thor. Well, <laughs> I think at this point Jason Aaron hates anything connected to the Avengers, um, considering <laughs> what he's doing to it. But uh, th- like that to me would be like the most understandable thing is that they're trying to give her more of a a persona beyond being the occasional love interest to Thor. So, which is cool because she's a cool character. So so one cool thing in this book that, uh, that I liked is the tie in back to what's going in in Thor Mm -hmm. and the fact that when Thor, uh, well, Donald Blake ripped, uh, Beta Ray Bill's soul from his body. He did steal his, his alternate personality or persona where he could turn back. Right. So there were consequences to what happened in that because they really haven't addressed it since then in the Thor book. So I'm glad that they've kind of addressed it now. So maybe he's mopey because Donald Blake has his soul in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe that and he's, <laughs> you know, not pretty enough, as he said. <laughs> well, so the, the whole he's lost thing. his hammer, he's lost his soul, and he lost Lady Sif all in in a manner of moments so and he got stuck with a horse know, face maybe yeah i mean and and now we find out that that's just a thing that they do to the people that become the guardians of their planet kind of a dick move if you ask me it is oh, for it real really has, is so has that always been a, <laughs> so i'm not the i'm not a beta ray bill like i'm not very knowledgeable on him uh, you know, this is one of those situations where i want to you know tap in our buddy jerry uh, because he, you know, digs the shit out of anything. And and Castro, who also, you know, I should say half of his arm is taken up by a Beta Ray Bill tattoo. But has that always been a thing? Or is that a new development in the history of Beta Ray Bill? Because I always assume, like, that's just what they look like. Um, yeah, I have no idea. I assume that that's what that uh, species look like as well. So yeah. I don't know if this is a retcon or not. We talked about it when it happened because we were like, oh, he stole beta ray bill's face um and it yeah. was all weird and stuff and i'd never seen anything like that so that may be one of those situations like like i said somebody else who is more uh astute in the history of the character than than us 
um, come tell us about it. Cause I, if, if that's like a new thing that Donnie Cates created or that, that Daniel Warren Johnson's thrown in there, that's, that's kind of big doings that's understated. Um, and as far as this book goes, explaining it for a little bit, because, you know, all of those people kind of look like those, the, the old school drawing of morph from the exiles until he got a horse face. So, um, <laughs> Which whatever happened. To I that. will say that uh, no idea, man. The the mutants come and go so much you can't keep can't keep track of them. Yeah. Um, Johnson's interpretation of uh, Fing Fang Foom is just absolutely amazing, dude. It's drawn so well. Yeah. I just uh, you know, as Matt said, it's so fluid on the pages. It's just uh, it's yeah. hard to be mad about the book. Ella in dynamic. any way very yeah. very dynamic yeah one of the one of my favorite things that he does is how he works in the the fx because if you've seen his pages like that's not included later but like like that's all on the pages um he draws his own effects uh, like the flump in the background or the kaboom or the bang in the pow he works that in to make it this this part of the page and, and that like that's impressive to me because you, you have to think about the lettering, you have to think about the storytelling and everything else. And just as he makes that part of the story, um, the other thing that he does is in his motion scenes, it, and you see that one scene where Fing Fang Foom like reaches up in the sky and just snatches um, <laughs> Beta Ray Bill out of the sky and knocks his little mohawk hat off um, or his legionnaire <laughs> hat, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, you know, he doesn't use any straight lines. Like everything is very, very sketchy and it gives this almost... Uh, it puts almost a a fuzzy layer over everything to show just to show how you know all the kinetic movement that's going on um which is neat because it makes it look well i think he just has a i think he has a loose style to begin with so you know i think it plays well to action his Mm -hmm. his style of drawing just plays well to action yep maybe that's intentional and maybe that's just you know good luck on his part but it it really does uh, i don't i don't think anything, I don't the, think the he loose lines and the yeah i don't think he leaves anything up to luck i think he knows exactly what he's doing um well i mean dropping that on page. your style is your style so if that style luckily plays into that sort of fluid action is what i mean right not that he couldn't you know some people's styles don't some do you know for sure. No, it, it just, it's, it's neat how he makes those things out of focus to show just, just to give it, it it's almost like, I almost want to see what he would do on a flash book. Um, just, just to He'd make him dance way. when he runs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare say that about him. <laughs> it, it would look like he's doing ballet while he's running. Oh my God. <laughs> So yeah, I'm staying on the book. I think it's a good book. I uh, I enjoyed the shit out of the art. Would stay on it for that reason alone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, and it's it's only five issues. People pick it up and read it. By the time you decide whether you want it or not, it'll be over. Oh, they want it. Even if they don't, they do. <laughs> we're, we're not going to let them. We're not going to let them live with their bad decisions. So oh, there you have it. Caleb like like Craig, go get it. Like Craig said, this is only a five issue series. I'm curious with you guys: is there a is in the Marvel universe what character do y'all want to see Daniel Warren Johnson tackle next? Darth Vader. Vader. That would probably be very nice. Um, Just based on his commissions that I've seen, his commissions he does of Darth Vader are outstanding. Really. Hmm. Oh, have you not seen those? That, that would be impressive. No, a dude. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'd have to put some thought into that. Probably, as far as so, Marvel characters, it's Darth Vader. I just said, Craig. Okay, I, I, there you I go. I'm Marvel the second. It's, it is a Marvel character. No, it is second Are to you that. Talking main mainline characters, though. Ah, anything. I think he'd do well in doing Spider-Man with the fluidity yep. of his action. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Conan. I'd like to see him do Conan. 
Oh, yeah. Conan would be you amazing. Know, you know, it'd be a lot easier to name the things I don't want him to do. <laughs> I'm going to go down a rabbit hole here. <laughs> I would like to see there you go. do if they can ever get the rights to like Rom Space Knight. Because he, he does really cool things with these like B and C level characters. You can't you can't ask us what he want, what yeah, you want him then, to do and, in the yeah. Marvel universe and then say, well, what I want is Marvel to get the rights to this character yeah. so he can do it in that universe. Well, I think they still have the right. I mean, they still have the Rom hell? rights. He's no, really I don't. No, IDW they do not. does. IDW yeah. has it. Oh, do they? Yeah. Okay, I thought because they still it, did it. Yeah, Colin Bunn did a series about three years ago. Okay, well then let me let me back up. Then I would like to see. Hmm. I think he Caleb could do, making his own rules. I think he could do a good job with the uh, with the first family. I think he could do really cool work with Fantastic Four. Um, I would. Yeah, I mean, what that's the that's the thing. It's easier to. He, what couldn't he do a fantastic job right. with? You know, I mean, it's like you could name just about. I mean, anything. Mm-hmm. You did, I mean, you'd have to purposely pick out a crappy character nobody cares about to think, well, maybe this one wouldn't work. Ooh, or it, it probably hit. wouldn't do well on U, U.S. Agent. What did you say, Craig? I said he probably wouldn't do well on U.S. Agent. <laughs> I can't believe you just said that about U.S. Agent. Shame on you, you traitor. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, no, I mean, I think if he did U.S. Agent, that would be the first time really that I've ever liked that character out of like, besides one issue of Force Works. But yeah, my, there's no my picks, bad characters. There's only bad writing. Facts, absolute facts. Um, well, all right. Well, mm, I, I disagree, wanna... but we'll go on. <laughs> what character is a bad character? I mean, seriously, uh, how about Blob or not? What's his name? Glob from the X Men. I hey. fucking love Glob. Or, 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 or eyeballs. Well, what is this? You know, or how snot. many? Well, is, is part of the show how many times Craig's can be wrong today? Is that part of the show? Now? No, I mean, seriously, what? <laughs> you, you, you enjoy eyeballs okay. as a character? Caleb, I, we should take mercy on this man and just move on to the next subject. I just, I love, my, I, mean, I love Glob. My, my feelings are hurt now. I mean, fine. He's a good character, but it, as a, in a superhero book, what's he do? He stands around and. He's just going to keep nothing. digging that hole, Caleb. You're just going <laughs> to let him dig that hole, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, what's he do? Let's gives, do gives Wolverine motivation to go kill somebody is big and awesome and see-through and then gets caught looking at porn. That's what he does. And it makes for excellent and... commentary. <laughs> All right. Give me, give me, give me Daniel Warren Johnson doing Howard the duck. That's what I want. That That's my answer. Give me, give me him doing Howard the duck. That shit would be funny. All right. So now that we've, we've started climbing up into the, the you know, to the more positive aspects of things. Um, tell me about a book that you read this week, Craig, that maybe I didn't. That's what I want to hear about. Oh, you, you've probably read this book. Maybe, maybe not. I'm going to talk about Uncanny X-Men number 266 from Marvel Comics. Uh, Chris Claremont, Mike Collins, Joseph Rubenstein, Brad Vincata, Pat Brousseau, Tom Orzakowski. You figure out what each of them did on the job, on the <laughs> book yourself. Um, <laughs> So Storm has been turned into a child. Research in previous issues, confusing Craig. In this issue, she finds herself in a mansion trying to recover some stolen paintings. But to quote Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. She soon finds herself confronted by the Shadow King and his mindless human minions, the Hounds. With her powers on the fritz, also for reasons you will have to research in previous issues, and her not wanting to hurt the human hounds that are also or that are under Shadow King's uh, control, Storm fights for her life, eventually falling two stories into a pool where she is pulled out by a mysterious stranger in a trench coat. After saving her, the stranger continues on his quest to steal the paintings for himself. And as Storm tries to escape, she soon finds herself in trouble again. The stranger 
finds himself in a conundrum deciding to help her as opposed to going for the art and after saving her introduces himself and the audience as gambit and uh before they escape, he is uh, mad that he isn't going to get the stolen art for himself. So he calls 911, giving the police the heads up on the location of said stolen art. And then there's this really cringy scene where they escape using Storm's parachute. And Gambit says something about if it wasn't for her age, dot, dot, dot. And, uh, yeah, once they escape, Storm tells Gambit he is now tied up in the Shadow King's snares and that he will be part of Shadow King's vendetta. So, yeah, this was the first uh, appearance of uh, Gambit, who is one of my favorite X-Men, because he doesn't just stand around a giant blob see-through that's, you know, watching porn. He actually has you know powers that are useful in combat and that sort of thing like sex and uh, yeah he uh he does have a charisma about him that you know people will listen to him and then he's got the blowy up stuff read uh read read a much gambit what's going on with gambit here lately have you no i have not actually read any of the newer stuff because all, all they ever do is try to make him the anti-hero anymore um which i mean i guess he's always been but yeah the the newer stuff has been not my cup of tea i guess i should say but the older stuff i really loved and really my love for gambit goes back to the old sega video game mm. where you could play gambit and wolverine and beat the entire game just by switching back and forth between us two and of course uh, you can <laughs> right because it's gambit and wolverine so yeah when you needed distance you used gambit when you needed uh hand-to-hand combat combat you used wolverine and you just alternated back and forth and could beat the whole game that way so yeah th- this is just one of those good books go back and uh you know, I love to go back and read some of these old books. It kind of gives me a touch of uh, reality or kind of grounding back into what drew me into comics in the first place. And, uh, you know, it's always fun to do. I just read it on Marvel Unlimited and uh, really enjoyed the crap out of this book. Marvel Unlimited is a gift. It really is. It is. It is. It is. I mean, and, unless you own a comic shop, but other than that, um, the fact. No, that even get... still, I mean, people aren't going to buy this book, and I mean, for the most part, they're they're not buying this book to read; they're buying this book to collect. Right. So, if you want to read it, you're probably still going to buy it from. You know, you're going to go to Marvel Unlimited or an Omnibus to read it, and you're going to collect it to collect a key issue. Mm-hmm. The fact that you can get everything that they've ever put out, for the most part. Um, yeah. Except for that one. I, I love his old section. costume, the, the purple onesie and the trench coat and the blue headband. You know, it was it was very a very very good costume for a thief sneaking in, and no one would ever recognize you in that costume <laughs> or be able to pinpoint you in a lineup later. I think it was the dude in the purple onesie over there. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be that guy. He's, <laughs> he's so inconspicuous. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah. a lot of those in New Orleans. Let's be honest. I mean, <laughs> is uh, there, but yeah, you know, is there anything ahead. about Gambit that is conspicuous? Like, uh, now that I, like, I've never really thought about it. He would make an actual terrible thief in real life. Like, no, the dude wears like neon colors. He glows in the dark half the time, or at least his eyes do. His eyes are actually pink. Um, he has the most recognizable accent ever outside of like 14 square miles in Louisiana. And and the guy literally said, I don't care if Rogue kills me, I'm still gonna be with her. Uh, true. I mean, there's dedication. He he, he did he did not care if she if her powers killed him. Same here. so you you relate really well to gambit is what you're saying on that angle definitely (laughs) 
Also, you'd like to blow stuff up with your mind powers, being able to that, be charge and stuff. That as well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it's a good fun book. Uh, you know, I kind of gave it a quick once over. There's some other things that happen in it, of course, but uh, an assassination attempt at the end of the book on uh, uh, <clears throat> Mystique ordered mm-hmm. by Shadow King. Uh, as as Claremont was wont to do, you know, this was the middle of a story, not just a one-off. Which is always hard to kind of jump into these books and and not know what happened in the issue before. Well, hell, usually but, Claremont you know, over-explains every one of them as far as he, what happened he, before. He actually did not in this issue. That's I had unusual. no reason why. I had Yeah, I did not know why she was turned into a child. I did not know why her powers were on the fritz. That's really um, weird. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I said you're going to have to go back and research in previous issues because he did not explain it in this one. But you're right because he usually did that pretty well. So, yeah. Um, if you're interested in Gambit's uh, first appearance, there you have it. Craig, have you ever listened to Jay and Miles explain the X Men? No. So there's a podcast and there, I mean, it's, it goes way back, but um, Jay and Miles are the, the host of the show and they actually go back to the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, Jay has been an editor. Uh, he, he's worked for Dark Horse. Um, Miles is, uh, I forget where he works for, but um, yeah, j- just uh, Jay is one of the world's foremost Cyclops experts. <laughs> Honestly, like the, the dude knows everything there is to know about about Cyclops and stuff. I think you would really dig that podcast as far as just like easy listening. He's it, yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. Um, I enjoy it. Cause like, I haven't read a lot of that stuff and, and the two of those, the, those dudes both go way back and, and explain well, not you only put- the X-Men, but like everything that tangents into the X-Men. So they, they go full out. Like they, they have a breadth of knowledge. We're sorry that you put all of your effort into the other Marvels team yeah, when you should have right. been putting it into the X Men team. Well, he was young and silly, Craig. Don't hold it against him. Not going to sit here and take this this besmirching of my Avengers just because they're currently being besmirched. Matt, tell me what you read this week, brother. Well, this is big doings. So, in honor of the of the big happening this week of the two pop culture icons that came together on the big screen, uh, you know, Kong versus Godzilla. I went back in my archives and I pulled out a comic that celebrated two major pop culture icons coming together uh, in a big, big way from 1995 from Topps Comics. Uh, The Topps trading card company got into the comics game at the height of the boom. And uh, one of the um, properties that they uh, put in comic book form is Jason versus Leatherface, (laughs) as in Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th movies. This sounds beautifully Uh, amazing. this, uh, This added a lot of dimension to pop culture. Um, it explores a lot of, uh, you know, human emotion. Um, you know, you're going to read a lot and you're going to experience a lot of ups and downs about relationships and why they are important and, um, why the quality of those relationships are important to human development interaction. Do Um, either of them mope a bit? Uh, they, they don't, you know, they're not whiny. They don't feel sorry for themselves. You know, that's not really what's going on in this I mean, that's book. That's kind of what Jason is, though, is he's kind of, you know, mopey. You killed my mom, you know. Incorrect. Now I got to kill all the teenagers. I mean, he's... So the book opens. Now, the, 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 the credits on this book, on this masterwork... Yeah, who, yeah, who gave us this masterwork? Please tell. Arkansas's own Nancy Collins is the writer. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Butler did the interior art. Uh, Steve Montano is the inker. Uh, Covers by the great Simon Bisley. The covers are why I picked this book up. 
um, the covers are, are just a lot of fun. As Why Simon else Bosley's. would you pick the book up? Well, because it's Jason versus Leatherface, all the right. reasons I just went over. Right. I mean, this is but the this cover, is now part of the zeitgeist. <laughs> I mean, this happened. This is the zeitgeist we're talking about here. Uh, oh, so yeah, it is. You op- you open the book, and the opening is poetic. It's amazing. The setting is, of course, Camp Crystal Lake, the home of Jason Voorhees, and the opening goes something like this. Once not long ago, Crystal Lake was a place where people came to enjoy summer, to see nature's beauty, and maybe to fall in love. But that was before Jason. Now Jason's evil, his undying hatred for those who live and love, hangs over the lake and the surrounding countryside. The laughter of campers enjoying summer's pleasure is gone forever. And what you go on to find out is... um, Jason is secured to the bottom of the lake via chains and concrete. And um, he is there just um, waiting, of course. In the meantime, since he went on this murder spree of these disgusting fornicators, the local industrial complex has been polluting the lake. And uh, they decide that uh, it's time to move locations to a more profitable area and they hire a dredging company said dredging company starts dredging the lake and uh, scooping up all the toxic waste transporting it south via train well when they're dredging they scoop up jason and uh, he is dredged along put in the tank and uh, as the train is making its way south jason of course breaks out of said tank and um, goes into an empty box car, uh, empty except for uh, one lone man and his dog. And uh, that interaction doesn't go so well. Um, <laughs> Jason quickly dispatches the uh, said man and dog with a machete and uh, then makes his way to the front of the train where the uh, staff is enjoying a card game. Uh, that doesn't go so well either for those guys, as one would imagine. I guess because they were gambling, Jason doesn't cotton to that or fornicating. So cotton uh, to that, <laughs> he dispatches said uh, sinners, and which causes the train to derail. Derails just outside of Sawyerville, Texas, home of the best barbecue in Texas, says the sign. <laughs> Making his way through the woods, he comes across a. Um, young man running and pleading for help uh and, and uh he runs across jason of course helps Mr. him right jason Forhees, who's uh always willing to lend a hand in some fashion but as he raises his machete to dispatch said whiny baby um leatherface and leatherface's brother happen upon the scene saying uh this guy was basically going to be their vittles and uh, causes a fight over said victim. Jason disarms Leatherface of his chainsaw, but instead of attacking Leatherface, he attacks this whiny victim who just will not quit crying. So cuts off the top half of his head and uh, then reaches down and picks up the chainsaw and calmly hands it to Leatherface. Because he senses a connection between those two. And uh, the leather Leatherface family invite uh, Jason back to the house because they think he's just their kind of guy. Once they get back to the house, everybody starts ribbing on Leatherface because uh, he got overpowered and lost his chainsaw. So Leatherface, you know, carrying the body of their victim, has an angry fit and throws it at his brother and runs upstairs to his bedroom. And... Um, some crying and moping leaves him crying in bed and jay in in, in leatherface's bedroom it, interestingly enough you know there are um horror movie memorabilia old universal horror <laughs> movie monsters and uh then there's a frank frazetta conan the barbarian poster on the wall so leatherface <laughs> is not all bad nice man of good taste and quality yeah you know so uh, the the uh, comic ends where they're all sitting down to dinner 
and they ask uh, their guest what his name is. And he dips his hand in the barbecue sauce on the table and writes it on the wall, Jason. And that uh, concludes the first issue in this monumental three-parter. And if you want to check this out for yourself, I cannot imagine why you wouldn't. They're in quarter bins everywhere. Uh, correction. Uh, the bidding on eBay on these issues starts around 50 bucks a piece. Really? Shit. And uh, if you buy the whole collection, you're looking at spend 250 bucks or more. Hmm. No shit. That is a straight up shoot, my friends. And I cannot begin to explain to you why that is. I bought these for a buck a piece. Um, I don't know, three or four years ago. Yeah. I mean, this can't end well for the Sawyer family. Because uh, they are not uh, super powered. They're just, you know, Crazy. evil. Yeah. Yeah. Cannibals. Uh Jason, you know, is super powered as evidenced by the fact that he's still alive after living at the bottom of the lake for, you know, who knows how long mm -hmm. in toxic yep. sludge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I can't imagine that issue three ends real well for the Sawyers. Well, look, let, let's be honest about it. Jason can't do anything to them that Rob Zombie didn't already do. So um, he didn't do anything to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre people. That's Michael Bay. Oh, was that Michael Bay? Yeah. Oh, that's even Talking worse. More of our childhood. <laughs> that's even worse. Yeah, oh. the remake was Bay. That's just yeah. saddening. Uh, yeah, Zombie did uh, the Halloween stuff was his remake. That's right. That's right. Okay, yeah, because he there was that whole scene with the horse in the hallway that he owes me money for. Yeah. Yeah. I really did try to find... I did, I really, I did do some research trying to find out why these comic books are going for 50 bucks or more an issue and i couldn't find any reason for that whatsoever and, and again i bought it for a, i bought these for a buck a piece yeah three yeah, so three or four years ago so nancy collins is an amazing writer yeah um you know so it, and part of me is really interested to see what the story does the artwork you know, and, on it's you, funny. The you it's really very, sold me. it's very bright. <laughs> it's very colorful, and it's, uh, it's got like a Saturday morning cartoon feel to it. it it's For very, sure. it's very, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> the, the art direction for you know the art direction they took on this. I mean, they it's got a it, you feel like you're reading a watching a Saturday morning cartoon or a Sunday morning comic strip in the uh, newspaper if, uh, for those of us old enough to remember those no, I do. It, I, it, it, that is it, an interesting way to go on the, i would have expected yeah. more of a realistic style no no especially with nancy collins you know i mean she did a great swamp thing run yeah it's got a, it's very um counterintuitive to the subject matter which yeah 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 it, it just gives the whole book a different feel it's it's, it's something. It really is something. It reminds you, you know, the th same thing we talked about with Chew, how you're dealing with this very dark mm -hmm. and gory subject matter portrayed yeah. in a very bright and cartoony way. Yeah. Same kind of same kind of feeling. Hmm. I, I I wonder if that's what the artist was going for. Oh, I can't imagine it was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just dumb luck found his, found himself there. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Too bad we we never got the tops crossover with Jason and NFL Super Pro. That'd have been fun. <laughs> That's they, uh, did, they did, did a Dracula. Out. Well, they did a Dracula one too. That was Magnolia, uh, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, work over that. Yeah, they've they've. I mean, Tops did a a handful of comics, and they were all intellectual properties. Mm -hmm. so they did a bunch of it, Kirby jack kirby stuff mm -hmm. yeah lady rawhide mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't surprise me that they they went this route but the a versus book with those two is so heavily handed in favor of one of them that it'll be interesting i thought it was weird as hell that they that the tops comic company did a Jason Voorhees versus Leatherface comic book. That, does, that stands out amongst all their other stuff, like, really yeah. strangely to me. 
Yeah. I mean, they do this. Yeah. I, I like this is, that just felt random and completely out of place with their portfolio. Yeah. If it was Avatar, you know, of course. Like, yeah. 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 yeah that, this is Avatar, you yeah. know, but yeah. Interesting. The only thing, the only thing I, I, I may have to of, try and find those. Like the only thing I can think of is because like with, with the book that Craig was talking about, the Dracula book, that was, that was connected to the film. So it makes me wonder if they didn't get like if they didn't license a package of of horror film rights just in a in a bundle. Well, it's like, hey, we've got this. Let's do. Well, something. but all of those are owned by different people. Yeah, um, which is also you know Leatherface and and Jason are owned by different yeah companies. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So you could only get that you you could only get this sort of fight in a comic book because <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't get those two licenses together for a movie ever, which things. was the whole reason new line started buying up. You know, they, they wanted, uh, they bought Freddie so that they could have, I mean, they bought uh, Jason, the Friday, the 13th series mm-hmm. so that they could have the Jason versus Freddie. And they already owned the uh, um, Hellraiser stuff. So, you know, the winner of that battle was supposed to fight Hellraiser or uh, Pinhead. So, yeah, um, nowhere in there is Leatherface. Right. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. Well, then it makes me wonder like, in the 90s, before all the corporate mergers and stuff go, went, and, and, you know, now you've got like these umbrella corps that cover everything. Um, like, you know, I, I don't think we'll ever get a DC Marvel amalgam thing again. It, you know this crossover between the two major corporations because god i hope not the ip well hey it was drawn by george perez at first that was you know at least we got something good out of it but it it was it would have been way easier to do those crossovers and stuff back then so i wonder if that's how that that happened just because the ownership wasn't so they they weren't owned by these massive corporations i like i'd I'd love to know the history of that now i'm because i didn't realize they were uh they were owned by you know different film companies hey craig i hypothetically Hypothetically, if, yeah. if a person didn't know a whole lot about people like Friday the 13th, that, that franchise, or the Jason franchise, is there an internet show that they could listen to or watch that would teach them about this? There actually is. There actually is. It's called Macabre Matinee, and it features nice. me and our old co-host, Sean, where cool. we sit around every week talking about uh, some uh, horror movies. Yeah, join. It's on YouTube. Uh, you can find us there. Just look up Macab, a uh, Macab matinee, and you will find us. Uh, we're there every week, putting out a new episode every Friday. Very cool. What are you guys we're talking currently, about? Currently, yeah, we're currently about um, halfway through the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, series. So. Nice. We've already done the uh, Friday the 13th series and uh, not sure where we're going when we're done with this. If a new horror movie comes out or something like that, we jump and do that. Like uh, we did Empty Man. We had uh, Jerry on guest hosting with us on Empty Man since it was a Colin Bunn mm-hmm. comic that it got turned into. And Jerry absolutely loved that uh, comic. So, um, you know, we'll jump out and and do a new you know anything new coming out we'll pause what we're doing and and throw that in there so that's awesome dude yeah that is yeah you know we have a lot of fun that's that's what it's all about man and you know sean and horror he knows those movies like the back of his hand so like i'm glad to see He, he really does yeah it's it's been a lot of fun well all right so, well yeah. i just wanted to thanks for thanks for that hey you know look that's that's what i do it's what i'm here for Make, making things happen um there you go hey you guys know how the tr- bermuda triangle is a weird place right yes yeah it's just kind of crazy like weird things happen there um well <laughs> there is a new comic <laughs> that came out i mean it's it's weird right like things disappear there people go away planes fall out of the sky there might be a kraken could be some mermaids. i saw those I saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Right. And I know that aliens took all that stuff. Aliens really are hoarders. Like they, <laughs> they steal and they just keep stuff forever for no reason. Like they have a problem. That's right. I think right. We need to, 
to focus on that. But there is a new book out, um, and I say new, it's, it's, it's a collected edition. It's called Spy Island, A Bermuda Triangle Mystery. And the cover of it caught my eye because it's, it's, it's the cover of it's kind of like multimodic mashup of, of comic art and like photography. So I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, a spy book that's going to use like real photography to tell a story. Let me go see what this is about. And then I got looking a little bit closer and I started to read the, uh, started to see the names on it that, that were connected to it. Um, that really kind of intrigued me. And we're talking about like writers like Chelsea Kane, uh, who I'm a big fan of, um, who hasn't been around a lot recently. Um, but then she got Laya uh, Mitternich to help do some of the art and some of the, the co- uh, hodgepodging together of, of a mixture of comic art and of, of mainstream art. Um, you've got Elsie McCall also doing some art on this. You've got Rochelle Rosenberg doing the colors and then the great Joe Caramanga, um, who does, you know, like 80% of the lettering of anywhere, um, did the, did letters in this book and they had put this book together originally, I think as a four issue mini series that was supposed to come out from, from dark horse, but for some reason, and I can, I, I don't know if it's because of COVID or they just got together and said, Hey, this works works better as a a whole um they decided to put it out in one bigger book which hey for me that was awesome because i didn't want to put the book down um so in the bermuda triangle there is an island and it's called spy island and shocker there's a lot of spies there it's kind of this um this no man's land if you will uh where people can come together talk about spy stuff um, hodgepodge, find work, uh, live a life of luxury because it is a, you know, it is a tropical island. And so lots of Mai Tais, grass skirts, uh, and what have you. Um, but it's also in the Bermuda Triangle. So there's lots of weirdness that goes around and the book opens up with this guy and he's out swimming. Um, and there's this kind of narrative about the Kraken and pulling people under, um, but as, as you know, kind of with all things mystery, uh, there's always that inkling that, you know, what might be supernatural could also be explained by just, you know, kind of life happening. Um, you see something suck this man under and he drowns. And there's this neat little diatribe, which turns out to be factual about how it's actually harder to drown someone in saltwater pools. Like it takes longer uh, because there's something about the saltwater in the lungs. Like it, it, it helps hold oxygen. So it takes like four to eight minutes longer to drown somebody in salt water, which I was kind of amazed by. Um, but it's not the Kraken that sucks this guy under. No, it's a spy. It is this uh, this this woman who is uh, kind of a jack of all trades, so to speak. She she's done a little bit of everything. She's worked as like black ops in Afghanistan. She's you know gone down to South America and done all kinds of different things. She even did a spell on Albuquerque, which I think she hated the, the most. Um, but, but she's there and she's just kind of hanging out, seeing what's going on, uh, trying to find new jobs and really trying to uncover a couple of, of personal mysteries there. And, and while she's there, she's, you know, she, she just kind of comments on the, the nature of the Island, how all of these, you know, the people from, you know, there's, there's agents of Mossad there. There's the French foreign legion. There's Angolian EIS. The KGE is there. MI6 is kicking around. Um, there's a guy named Doug who wears white suits and has a skull mask for some reason. He's a freelancer. We don't really know. Um, but there's also a gentleman there who is English, who actually works for MI6, who has caught her eye uh, and they canoodle a little bit. They've got this kind of uh off handish sexual relationship where i think he wants more she might not want to because you know he's all the time going up to her and her name's nora and it's like hey you know like this is something and and no this is this is you know she just kind of takes advantage of it to to knock boots um but there's not just spies on this island right like it, it is they have to make money somehow so they're also a tourist destination uh and so you know she's kind of keeping an eye on who's coming in uh, and who's leaving the island on the boat. And, you know, it's always curious when you watch people, uh, you know, are these people spies? You know, what's their story? She, she enjoys seeing them come and go. Um, 
because with every new boat comes money and a new threat. Uh, and this island's culture is kind of built up around that. You know, they have the, you, you get off the boat and every, every other night, whenever the boat comes in, they have the the big dance off to, you know, to worship the Kraken and tell the stories. And they warn people about the mermaids that, um, that, that are around the island uh, and, and will snatch up kids and take people away. And, you know, these, these are, not unlike the mermaids that you see in sea of sorrows craig uh you know big nasty creatures lots of lots of teeth and stuff um you know looks like shark teeth you know you find mermaid teeth all around it but they warn you not to walk out because you'll you'll disappear um and as as nora's watching people come off the boat one day she sees a familiar face that she's didn't expect to see and it's her sister uh, nora's sister is you know she she graduated from community college she's her degree is in um in oceanic uh, detective work, best I can figure. I mean, there's some fancy name for it, but essentially she's, she specializes in, in things that go uh, boom in the night underneath the water. Uh, you know, mermaids, krakens, creepy space alien, uh, weirdness, giant squids. Uh, and she's there because there's, they're getting reports of missing people. Um, and she, she's got to figure out what's going on. Um, and that kind of sets this mystery off, um, as they're there, people start, the, the wrong people start disappearing. Teens start going away. Um, a, a German woman has lost her child, uh, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And this is very unsettling to the spy community because the spy community is, you know, normally in on the secret, right? Like they, they normally can keep it, um, keep it together and they know, know where everybody is and what's going on and and when somebody disappears why but this isn't that like the the wrong people are going away um and and nora needs to jump in and help her her sister figure all of this out and it's going to have some some issues it's going to it's going to hit home in the meanwhile in the backdrop of all this is nora's relationship to this mime that kind of floats around the island um who they seem to have a, a, a more than, uh, you know, uh, more than casual relationship, not a, not a sexual relationship by any means, but there seems to be a history there that, that goes away from the Island. Um, and what you come to find out is the backdrop of this is the mime is actually her father. Uh, and her father was a mafia guy, right? Like he was a, a little bit of a made man, but, daddy did some bad things daddy flipped on the wrong people and had to go into the witness protection program and they tried lots of personalities they tried you know seeing how his life would work as a cowboy seeing how um you know an astronaut a businessman that you know kind of anything and everything somehow <laughs> somehow they landed on mine uh and he is at this island living as mine um but her sister doesn't know this and that becomes a major part of the plot as well uh, and it kind of goes on from there. Um, you know, secrets unfurl. There's a Corgi, lots of fun times. The book is ridiculous. Uh, the, the twists and turns that, that happen in the book, it, it's just like they pulled things out of a hat, but it doesn't feel like they, it, it doesn't mesh well. Like this was a completely come everything that branches off of this loops back in and has a purpose. It is, it is, it is ridiculous. There's no other way to put it. It's funny as shit. The, you, you fall in love with the characters. Um, it reminded me a little bit of like assassination uh, with some of the way that some of the characters were, were put together. Like, you know, the character of Doug um, there's some elements of that. The artwork is, the artwork is, is interesting because again, it's not all just comic art and the comic art that's in here is, is good. Like it looks great. It's got this, a uh, little bit of a 1960s comic style, um, you know, just a little bit of a pop art style, but the way that they interlace um, real things like photography, um, real facts, the, the, the way the book is put together um, where you would see ads in an old school comic book, you see ads in this book, but it's like travel ads trying to get people to come to the Bermuda Triangle. And there's clues in each one to help you kind of uncover this uh, this mystery. 
Um, there's, you know, there's different, uh, like if you, uh, four or five pages in this book, give you a drink um, recipe uh, for different, different types of Mai Tais, different types of island cocktails. Um, there's ads for things that will happen on the island if you were a tourist. Um, some of the pages in the book will zoom in on like, you know, somebody's purse and show you the contents and it'll be everything from, you know, uh, syphilis itch cream to, uh, you know, a PP7 pistol, um, a lighter with a Kraken on it. So it really uses these. And again, all, none of those things are drawn. They're actual pictures of stuff like a cassette tape and stuff. And then it goes back into being just, just a standard comic art. From that aspect alone, I really enjoyed just just the design of the book. I thought it was really fun um, because it it bounces all over the place and it adds to the mystery. <clears throat> like I said, you know, they, they talk about kids going out and, and trying to find quote unquote mermaid teeth um, and they show just a collection of mermaid teeth, but they're actually like sharp teeth and fangs and uh, different things that have been pulled out of the water. Um, and there's a little disclaimer at the bottom, you know, not actually mermaid teeth just kind of show you like this is part of the mystery they've taken these um they, they've taken these natural items and created a mythos uh around it i thought it was really really well done i i love mystery books i love detective stories and at the end of the day uh, this book the closure that you get from the stories um it leaves you wanting more but it will leave you smiling um you know, it, it really talks about like you, you you somehow fall in love with just these really shitty people because there's nobody good in the story. Like, you, you know, everybody's a spy. Everybody's a murderer. Um, everybody's got a secret. Everybody is uh, out for themselves. But you really start rooting for them for some of the right reasons, some of the wrong reasons. And you just at the end of the day, want these characters to to be to, to win the game they're playing, if that makes sense. Um, and it doesn't work out that way. Uh, you, you start to see more and more betrayal of, uh, of family members, more and more betrayal of people that you didn't know were there. There's lots of these fun little twists in there. So if you can find this again, it's, it's called spy Island. Uh, it's a Bermuda triangle mystery. It is fun. It, it, it is like you, you know, mix a drink while you read it and sip it through a straw because you're going to laugh. <laughs> um, I mean, there's a mime in a Kraken suit. <laughs> like, it, like it's, there's, there's a mime in a dark, a dark ox suit um, that, that it strikes terror <laughs> into the underwater world. Um, you know, the MI6 dude totally makes fun of, of James Bond. He spends the majority of time walking around in a speedo. That's just the, the British flag on his dick. It's it, it, for, for no reason other than sheer comedic uh, injection into like the most ridiculous moments. So um, yeah, no, if you can find this, I encourage you to read it. It's it, I've always been a fan of Chelsea Kane. Uh, and, and I know some people some like her more than others. Um, you know, I know she's had a little bit of a, tumultuous relationship with quote unquote fandom um you know she's you know people who are misogynist generally hated her presence on the internet because she was very um very outspoken and would just kind of go after people she did good work on this book uh, as she always does um it was it was cool very cool i've always enjoyed uh Bermuda Triangle stories, but again, once I watched uh, Close Encounters, I knew that the answers were aliens. So. Just kind of ruined it for you? Yeah, yeah. You know, I grew up always just uh, curious about Bermuda Triangle stuff, and yeah. So you know. It's where planes go to. No, I, I'll, I'll have to, yeah, I may have to check that one out. I think you'll dig it, and and like I said, it's a fully encompassed story, all four issues in one uh, one package, and they did a really good job with that package. Like that, that, that I think is what impressed me the most because you can see where the, each of the issues starts and begins and they just, they kind of wrap the space around it in this uh, ephemera that, that connects to the world and, and nice. it grows the world and, and adds context to things that, uh, you know, if you don't want to spend 
five minutes pouring over them, you're not going to miss any major parts of the stories, but it's a mystery story. So like there's clues embedded there. Um, so it, yeah, it was cool. Checks very, in. very cool. Need more. We need more mystery stories and we need more ridiculous mystery stories. So fun stuff. Well, what's coming out next week, guys? New comic book day every Wednesday. Our local comic shop, you know, shout out to Kapow Comics over in Sherwood. They they stick new stuff on the shelves for us, uh, which gives us a reason to go over there. It's they're kind of our drug dealer, if you will. Um, they are. They they are going to hook us up this next Wednesday. What are you guys excited about grabbing? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, I'm really excited about this series called Silver Coin. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an anthology horror series from Image Comics. But every issue is drawn by Michael Walsh, but every issue is written by a different artist, including Chip Zdarsky, Kelly Thompson, Ed Brisson, Jeff Lemire. So yeah, in there, it's like I said, a, a horror series um, for mature audiences. It says so. Um, oh, that rules us in this, Yeah, right. <laughs> I am definitely interested in the series, mature or otherwise. You gotta, you gotta grow up. You don't have to be mature. There you have it. This uh, something that looks interesting to me <clears throat> is this book from Boom Studios. Magic the Gathering number one. Did you guys see this? I did. I did I see it, it, and the creative team was what uh, drew yeah. me into it. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Jed McKay is writing, and um, Igara. I don't know. I mean, yeah. That's the artist, apparently. Is how you say that, I guess. I don't have any knowledge or history with Magic the Gathering other than I know Henry Rollins' cousin developed the game. Isn't it Mateo is- Scalera mm-hmm. on that? Well, yes, him, but also, I mean, it's got, I mean, it says Ig Gara as the artist. Okay. M- maybe Mateo, Mateo Scalera does the covers. It's not clear on what I'm reading. But gotcha, gotcha. This says that, you know, this is for existing long-term Magic the Gathering fans and people that are new to the property as well. So this has got me curious, mostly because Jed McKay has just been on such a tear lately. I can't help but wonder. Um, if this is something that I would be into, um, it'd be a potentially a very easy way to be introduced to this yeah, uh, magic gathering pull, thing. Yeah, I may have to pull the first one off the shelf. Um, just because, like I said, the creative team is such a strong pull for me on this. Yeah. Well, Matt, as much as you love like high fantasy and stuff, I think you would enjoy it. Um, yeah, I've, I've played magic six games. months later, M- Matt's playing, uh, Magic the Gathering at the yeah, card we, store, you know, it's sitting in his own diaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we in my own diaper. <laughs> As, As opposed, opposed to somebody, somebody else's diaper. <laughs> you, you never know with that group. So I think there's a lot of, uh, there, uh, so we've got, there's a lot of folks who play Magic the Gathering that, um, that we know that we are, are yeah. that I know. So it, it's, I've tried to get into it. I'm not, um, super dedicated to card games and the like but the artwork on those cards if you've ever like taken a minute yeah. to look through them, the artwork is ridiculous um my connection to match the gathering was always through the the novelizations um because the there have been some really really good like high fantasy novels that have been um pulled out of the kind of mythos around the cards so if you if you if you like high fantasy books and you're looking for a place to to look, find you know new things to read you've never checked out but you're not interested in the card game check out the novels because they're really good there's a lot of them spend a lot of time I'm I'm gonna hope that there's an extra copy of this on the shelf because I'm gonna check out the comic if it's available nice excited about it well that was actually gonna be the book I was gonna tell y'all about um, but man. <laughs> Matt being a man of good taste and, and, and a quick draw beat me to it, but our buddies over at scout comics have a new book coming out. I've been really impressed with scouts um, output since they came on my radar. Um, mostly because uh, Craig knows and hooked us up with some people who were involved in them, but this book is being, um, being written, drawn and um, created by Ralph Singh, uh, Hans Radke and Miko Montlow. Uh, and the book is called impure. Uh, and it's, 
what caught me as with most things is the cover um you know that's as i was rolling through here i saw it and the guy's got kind of this uh a mix between iron man and kylo ren kind of look to him um and i was like oh that's neat let me see what this is and so reading the uh, the the blip about it is the newest entry from scout non-stop imprint years after nero and N minerva's homeworld caster was destroyed by aliens the siblings join the dreaded earth forces to ensure that something like this will never happen again when minerva betrays nero and all that they ever believed in it's up to nero to stop his sister before she reaches the alien alliance uh, for what minerva has stolen may well turn the tides against the war um so there, you know, there's there's a little touch into this kind of futurism retake of of mythology that that I think is going to be really cool. Scout's doing some great work, so uh, check that out. It's called the Impure Number One, and it'll cost you three ninety nine. Nice. That's it for four bucks. You can get some good good. So, well, all right. There you have it. Else we need to talk about no. none at all. None. I think we did everything. Yeah. Well, Hoping right. I have more than three comics to read this week. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I had a few more than that. It's been light for a minute, guys. It has been. Yeah, my week, my weeks have been really light for well, ever since, gosh, November last year. Yeah, yeah. that's why I'm uh, talking about a lot of old books, and Matt's talking about, you know. Freddy or Jason versus Leatherface and trying to give you that good entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> trying to broaden your horizons, expose you to different artistic takes. That's what I'm trying to do. I don't know about this. There you go. Inter inter if I happen to entertain you, that's just a bonus. That's a byproduct. It was unintentional. <laughs> Matt really walks a, really outside, raises really his fist, mm -hmm. yells at the clouds. Are you not a, entertained? This is all. This is really about education. Yeah. Uh huh. I mean, I find myself reading a lot more. You know, as far as the stuff I pick up from the comic shop, like I think I had eight or nine books this week, but most of it's independent stuff. Um, and then I find myself reading like all the books on my short stack this week were collected editions. Um, you know, there there weren't any singles. It's you know some of them I even you know are stuff I grabbed off the shelf at. Uh, Barnes and Noble as opposed to the comic shop. So there's still lots of comics out there, but yeah, no, the, the monthly floppies have been weird. Ooh, yeah. The distri uh, distribution of them has been sporadic, I would say. All right. So it's right. weird world, weird world and the floppy uh, dynamics of everything. Right. But uh, you know, come tell us what you're reading. Maybe we've missed things. Like, you know, we try to do our due diligence and flip through previews and check out the new, new, and sometimes we miss things. So jump over to our Facebook group or Instagram page, or even tag us on Twitter. We're at SFG podcast, all of those. If you have any complaints, comments, concerns, or you want to run down your pull list, whatever, or maybe you're a creator that has done some indie work and you want us to talk about it, you can shoot us an email or southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. Easy to get a hold of. Um, maybe not so easy to email you back because, you know, time. Uh, but that's a thing. Um, so other than that, we're going to be back at about the same time, same place next week, talking about some new books, um, seeing what's happening. Um, so we hope you will join us. Uh, and, and we would love it if on iTunes or if whatever aggregator you use has a place where you can leave us a rating and review, drop five stars on there for us. And then, you know, leave a little nice blurb, say, Hey, this, this podcast is worth listening to because these guys know things and talk about them. Um, and at least have fun doing it because that's what it's all about. Right. We, we just enjoy each other's company and we enjoy chatting um, about the books that we love. So come back and see us. And while you're doing that, while you're waiting on next week, go forth and love some comics. Ooh. Mm -hmm.